Um, thank you all for coming. I apologize for my voice. I just lost it. Um, but very pleased to introduce Tal Levy, who has come up from uh, Corvallis at University uh, Oregon State. Sorry, Tal, just got Thank the wrong one. You didn't get that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So uh, he was an uh, assistant professor of wildlife and now uh, recently associate professor. And um, he has a, a tall, he studies so many different things, I can't even uh, keep up with the latest and greatest, but uh, that's one of the great things about his work. It's incredibly creative, um, looking at a variety of conservation related issues, uh, new genetic, in implementing genetic techniques and new technologies. Um, he's a background in physics, so he got his undergrad at Berkeley in physics and biology, um, and then went on to UC Berkeley where he did his PhD with Chris, what, did I, did I see Berkeley again? Sorry, UC Santa Cruz. Um, where he, he did his PhD with Chris Wilmers and I wrote it down, Mangal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, uh, then went on to do an NSF postdoc. Um, why did I write this down if I'm not even looking? <laughs> uh, NSF postdoc with Bob Holt, now I remember. Uh, looking at Lyme's disease, and that's one example of some of Tall's creative work, looking at connections between loss of wolves, impacts on coyotes and foxes, and implications for Lyme's disease. Um, and um, I'm going to stop there before that's I mangle this funny. introduction <laughs> anymore and let him Very good. tell you about his work you know, himself. I, I wouldn't start with just a little introduction, actually, because um, when people talk to you about stuff, it's useful for them to know what you do, and mostly I'll be talking about stuff that's pretty different than what we normally do. I'll just zoom through this quickly because I like cool pictures and stuff. Um, we have a bunch of students working on carnivores, including some stuff with Fisher and Martin, uh, some stuff about bears I'll talk about, uh, one student working with spotted skunks, which is really poorly studied, and then we've got this uh, carnivore project in Eastern Oregon. We've done a lot of wolf diet analysis regionally throughout Southeast Alaska. And then Charlotte's working on these, I just cannot not show a video of aquatic jaguars, right? <laughs> Talk has nothing to do with them, but what's cooler than aquatic jaguars? Um, so carnivore ecology is one theme, disease ecology is another theme. So we work in this landscape in the southern Amazon uh, with leishmaniasis, and so we collect sand flies, mosquitoes, but sand flies are the vector here, and see how, uh, how land exchange might affect disease risk. And we've started uh, quite a bit of work with white nose syndrome, and Laura talked about Lyme disease stuff. And then a third big theme is molecular methods. So we're currently finishing up the Oregon Biodiversity Genome Project, at least the, the aquatic components. We've sequenced the mitochondrial genomes of all the, the aquatic vertebrates. And then uh, we've got quite a lot of eDNA work, especially with this anatomous smell called Yulcon, or Hooligan, or Hooligan, depending on where you're from. And we've tried to quantify fish abundance with environmental DNA. That's been a big theme recently. And then a project I'm really excited about now is trying to do biodiversity surveys in the Pacific Northwest, centered at H.J. and just expanding the forest from sort of all growth forest to plantation forest and everything in between. So that includes uh, invertebrates, soil forest for fungi, especially the hypogeous fungi that fuel our food web. Our, our food web's really truffle driven. So that's the kind of stuff we do in the lab, but uh, I'll talk about stuff that no, none of my students work on. This goes back to tropical forest ecology, and I'll talk about how I think tree diversity is maintained in tropical forests. That's, that's how we'll start. So I want to start with a quotation from Egbert Lee's paper in Biotropica, which, which I really love because it tells you the scale of tropical forest diversity. Right? How can half a square kilometer of rainforest in Borneo or Amazonia contain as many tree species as the 4.2 million square kilometers of temperate zone forests combined? It's just incredible. So there are mechanisms of diversity generation, but we also need to be able to maintain this diversity. And there's, there's quite a, a large literature on trying to explain how we can maintain such diversity. So I should say I got interested in this because my career in, in biology really got started with monkey hunters. Uh, so I was working in the Peruvian Amazon, and we work with monkeys, and 
people are killing them, you start to think about their ecological importance. One of the key things they do is disperse these sort of large seeded fruits with indehiscent exocarps that only they can pull apart and only they have sort of are large enough to swallow these things and disperse seeds through gut passage. So the thing that comes up a lot when you work with monkeys are Janssen Connell effects. So if you're not familiar with the Janssen Connell hypothesis, two independent published papers in the early 70s, are that seeds that land near a parent plant are doomed due to post-specific natural enemies. These are things like fungal pathogens or invertebrates, vertebrates. So you're much more likely to die if your seed doesn't make it away from some escape zone near a parent plant. And it looks kind of like this in the original um, Janssen drawing. It's adapted by Turbor. You've got some natural seed shadow. You've got some escape curve where survival probability increases as you move away from a conspecific adult. And sort of this overlap influences where you get tree recruit. That's the, that's the hypothesis. If you lose seed dispersers, this gets truncated, you have know, less ability to recruit. Not enough seeds make it far from a parent plant. So I don't want to talk about Janssen Connell effects too much because there's this incredibly large literature on Janssen Connell effects now. I just want to say that they're extremely strongly supported. So this is Liza Comita's meta analysis. There's not controversy over whether Janssen Connell effects exist. There's observational evidence, tons of experimental evidence. We know that they exist. It's just not clear if they can support biodiversity. What is the implication of Janssen Connell effects? I would like to show you at least one visual from Varun Swamy's work. This is just one tree, the simplest one, because there's only tree ad two adults here. So you're looking on a landscape, green is an adult tree. Oh, laser pointer by any chance. I'm good at waving. Right. <laughs> You've got one uh, adult tree that's reproductive. The darkness here is the number of seeds collected in seed traps. So there's a seed trap array. And then red triangles here are saplings. Right, here's a, a tree that meets the adult class type DBH, but is not reproductive. And what you see is that like, saplings are not recruiting where you expect, right? And across tree species, this, this kind of operation uh, is made where this is where all the seeds are landing, no sapling production. Okay, so we know this happens in tropical forests, but can Jensen Connell effects maintain observed levels of tree diversity, which is really around a thousand trees? Right. You can have a thousand conspecific trees in tropical forests. Okay. So another way to ask this question is how many species can Janssen Connell effect support? So I wanted to say I know there are many theories of plant diversity, but you can roughly break all theories of diversity under modern coexistence theory into two broad mechanisms that are called stabilizing mechanisms or equalizing mechanisms. So the idea is that Stabilizing mechanisms allow species to recover from low density. Some way that you don't go extinct through something like ecological drift if you're at low density. These include niche partitioning, which I'm sure you know very much about, and Janssen Connell effects, and equalizing methods, mechanisms, which is most famously Hubble's neutral theory. The idea here, well, I'll get to these in just a second. Okay, so niche partitioning, you're able to overcome competition because you're a superior competitor under some narrow conditions. Right, imagine some niche hypervolume, and you're really good at outcompeting everybody under these narrow conditions. Some other species is really good under some other narrow conditions. It's been very difficult for this to explain tropical forest diversity because it's just a flat landscape with no seeming biological gradient to speak of. I mean, obviously, in some locations, you've got rainfall gradients, flood forest, which is not. There certainly are niches, right? But in these lowland tropical forests, you've got a thousand tree species seemingly competing for the exact same resources. So this has been relatively unsuccessful. Uh, Hubble tried to explain diversity by saying, forget about competition. All these, all individuals are created equal, right? There, there is no difference in per capita fitness. And if that's the case, it just takes a long time for tree species to go extinct. The process of extinction in the absence of competition is called drift. Right? Just through random chance events like playing blackjack, sometimes you win money, sometimes you lose money. But once you go to zero, you're done, right? So trees drift up and down, but eventually they all go to zero, and any system should approach monodominance. So Hubble's mechanism for maintaining diversity was really similar to island biogeography. There's going to be extinction, there's got to also be colonization. So here it was dispersal from a meta community or speciation, where there's going to be some source of new species. Okay, so it requires this external mechanism. And the Janssen Connell hypothesis is another prominent theory of tropical forest diversity, is this natural enemy hypothesis. Right? 
Most specific natural enemies live near the parent plant and they prevent any one species from reaching monodominance. Because if you can't recruit near yourself, you're not going to get a Douglas fir forest, right? You're not going to get some homogeneous situation. Okay. What I think is cool is that this is the only one that really depends on species interactions with animals and fungi. So it's just something interesting. This is the mechanism. Um, and since I like species interactions, that's the unifying thread, right? <laughs> right. Um, okay, so pretty quickly, Hubble argued that Jantz O'Connell effects could only support a few species. And so now you're looking down in the landscape, and every number here is a tree species ID. So species one, two, three. And if the only rules you can't recruit near yourself at equilibrium, you should end up with some sort of lattice structure. Because one can't recruit near one, two can't recruit near two. So if the rule is that you have to be at least one tree crown away from a conspecific, one is one away from one, two is one away from two, three is one away from three, and so on, you can only maintain three species by this mechanism, right? It doesn't seem nearly strong enough to support a thousand conspecific trees. And once you get to two tree crowns, you can support seven species, right? One is two tree crowns away from one, and so on, right? So you should end up with some sort of lattice structure. Are you with me? That's the only rule. That's where you should end up. Okay. So Hubble made this argument that Jansen Connell effects, while they may occur in tropical forests, are very unlikely to maintain biodiversity. You can only maintain seven species. And a few years later, Becker et al. wrote a rebuttal more or less, or paper in response. And they thought, they said, you don't have to think about this as an equilibrial problem. Right? It takes more disturbances, in this case there are tree deaths or groups of tree deaths, to accumulate the same number of extinctions when you have Jansen connell effects than when you don't. So what, what that means is that you've got to kill more trees to cause more extinction when you have Jansen connell effects. Um, so you don't have to think about this as an equilibrial problem. They did this on a, it's just a, a basic simulation, 10 by 10 array, 25 species, very small simulation. They just tracked it up to 13 extinctions. Okay, more disturbances to accumulate extinctions with Jansen Connell effects than without. Okay, they went on to say the question of whether this effect is sufficiently strong to help explain the coexistence of many tree species in tropical forests is not so easily answered. Okay, why isn't it so easily answered? Well, it was 1985 and they were working on this piece of junk. <laughs> right? 128 kilobytes of RAM, kilobytes of RAM, 10 megabyte hard drive. They're working on a piece of junk, right? Now we've got the Center for Genome Research and Biocomputing, we've got a terabyte of RAM, we've got multi-threading, much different situation. Okay, so we can revisit this problem. Right? Let's, let's look at these transient dynamics, not over some small number of tree deaths, like 500, but let's go out into the billions. So here's a simple simulation. Same kind of thing, every number here is a tree species ID, not related to abundance, right? A tree randomly dies. We're going to do this on four landscape sizes, from 200 by 200 up to 1600 by 1600, right? So doubling the dimensions on each side. We randomly choose a tree to die, then we randomly choose a tree to replace it. And then we say, ask, is that tree within an exclusion zone? So in this case, within one unit of tree species six, tree species six cannot recruit. So that's an excluded move. So then we randomly select another tree, although 5% of the time we allow an excluded move. So 5% of the time we'll allow tree species six to recruit. Then we randomly select tree species two. Tree species two is allowed to move. It's not within one unit of itself. Right? Okay, and that's one iteration. And we do this 200 billion times, which depending on the landscape size, is somewhere around 15 and a half million years up to about a billion years. Okay, which is, now we're talking about evolutionary time scales, right? This is the time scale we need to work on. All right, and so we did this on, on, on four different exclusion zones, actually five. So one is no exclusion, which is essentially neutral theory. This is all neutral theory is, but without the dispersal from the meta community for speciation. The smallest possible exclusion zone, which is just the target tree cannot be replaced by itself, which if you're a farmer, you might call replant disease, like if your fruit tree dies, don't plant that same tree there, right? That's, that's what this is. Then there's a exclusion zone, one crown, two crowns, or three crowns. So progressively larger exclusion zones. 
And so you do this really simple simulation, but you follow out the transient dynamics for a really long time, and then you see what happens. And sometimes, in ecology, it takes a really long time to reach equilibrium. Okay, so this is a really messy figure, but I'm going to walk through it. We've got species richness on the y-axis, and I've got tree repla replacements linearly through time, which is the dashed lines. And because it just looks like it crashes and then goes horizontal, I've also got it plotted with the solid lines and log tree replacements. But it's hard, it's hard to think in log space, right? Because every unit is 10 times log base 10. Okay, so we're going up to 200 billion iterations. And what, what I want you to see is on these progressively larger landscapes, you get this crash of tree species richness from our initial condition of 1,000 species. And then you get these essentially horizontal lines where you're maintaining things at some sort of pseudo-equilibrium. It's not an equilibrium, right? Because in log, once you log transform, or you look at it on the log axis, you can see that the extinctions are still happening. The extinction rate is slowing to such an effect that it takes forever to lose any additional species. Right? So extremely prolonged transient dynamics. And of course, the number of tree species you maintain after 200 billion iterations is larger when you exclude three tree crowns, then two, then one than just the target tree. With no exclusion zone, you reach monodominance quite quickly. So once you get to here, that's about less than a billion iterations, you're already at monodominance. Okay. And on the larger landscapes, you maintain more diversity. And on the largest landscapes, like 800 by 800 or 1600 by 1600, for some exclusion zone sizes, you lose no species over 200 billion iterations. So here again, you get monodominance with no exclusion zone. But even the simple rule, the target tree cannot be replaced by a conspecific, can maintain several hundred species on an 800 by 800 tree landscape. Or in this case, about 600 species on a 1600 by 1600 landscape. So what, what that means is that the weakest possible exclusion zone, the target tree cannot be replaced by itself, alone is able to combat ecological drift and maintain sort of observed levels of diversity. The next question is why aren't we losing any species? Like here, if there's one tree crown or larger, we're not losing any species. Maybe this depends on, on our initial condition. So let's probe this a little more. So we ran the same simulation starting with 3,000 species. That's the dashed lines here. Now again, with every different exclusion zone, I'm just showing you this for 800 by 800. And what I want you to see here is that Regardless of your initial condition, if you start with 1,000 or 3,000, you end up at the same point. So there really is some sort of attractor. You really are approaching pseudo-equilibrium. It's becoming, that depends on your own species richness, right? You're, you're approaching a specific species richness that you're going to follow the trajectory on through time. So we have to explain this. <clears throat> and so these, these situations that at 1,000, species didn't lose, at that initial condition, didn't lose any species. They didn't lose species because we didn't start with enough in our initial condition. So right, eventually, this is going to start to level off a little bit above 1,000. Green is now going to approach green and maybe converge right around here, and so on. Okay. Okay, so why does this happen? So there's. We were able to develop an analytical model, use that to produce simulations. We showed the analytical model and the simulations produce really similar results. So when you analyze the results of that model, this is really what's going on. When you have high species richness, what I'm showing you now on the y-axis is the advantage of being rare in the top panel, which is the ratio of probability you increase in abundance relative to the probability you decrease abundance if you're a rare species. And at the bottom, this is the ratio of probability of common species increases relative to the probability it decreases. So this is the advantage of rarity and the disadvantage of commonality. For rarity, we just went as, as you approach zero. For commonality, you're, you're twice as abundant as all the other species, which are equally abundant. So there's some simplifying assumptions here. But what I want to get across is that at high species richness, the advantage of being rare is relatively small. But of course, it's better to be rare if there's a large exclusion zone. But as species richness starts to decline, it becomes increasingly advantageous to be rare. Why? Well, as species richness declines, the remaining species, the non-rare species, more of the landscape is excluded to them. 
right? So if a tree dies, they're less likely to be able to take that spot. That supplies an advantage to the rare species. None of the landscapes exclude to you if you're rare, right? Your, your natural enemies are only near you, so any tree that dies is a possible move. Okay. So this is the mechanism. It's sort of like community regulation, right? You're, you're approaching uh, a set diversity because as species riches declines, right, drift wants you to go extinct, but you get this increasing advantage that compensates drift. That's, that's what's going on here. Okay, so the next question is how weak can Janssen-Connell effects get and still maintain diversity, right? The, the fact that just the target tree can't be replaced by itself can maintain quite a lot of diversity. We then wanted to ask, what if we change the force rate? So here's the target tree, where it's super weak effects, but we're still maintaining a, a modest sized landscape of 800 by 800, we're maintaining 200 tree species. And it turns out that in our default settings, 5% force rate, 5% of the time an unallowable move um, is allowed. The results are not that different when you allow 20% or 50% unallowable moves. So now this would be like a mind blowing maybe chance of common effect compared to the observations. 50% of the time a tree can be replaced by a composite. That, that just doesn't happen in the force. Okay. So that's what we're observing. So even very weak effects maintain a lot of diversity. If you take these results after 200 million iterations and you just construct a species area curve, this gets you right, a long log plot. This is the power law that you expect species area curves to look like. Right? So we're talking about you can scale up from smaller scale tree diversity over to regional scale tree diversity. So these are 200 by 200 landscape, 4 by 4, 8 by 8, 1600 by 1600. And here it is again on a log scale. So you can see how species richness scales with the area and how it's influenced by the size of the exclusion zone. Okay. Uh, and recall that our threshold, right, this is the most observed tree species in tropical forests, is right around 1,000. So it's not hard to achieve more than 1,000 species uh, with modestly sized exclusion zones and modestly sized landscapes. Okay, so conclusions from this part. Uh, I think sometimes relatively simple simulations give you profound answers, and I think observed levels of tree diversity can certainly be maintained nearly indefinitely due to these really prolonged transient dynamics, even with really small exclusion zones, and even when you have high force rates, meaning you allow unexcluded moves some proportion of the time. Which means we don't need these features of neutral theory like dispersal from a meta community or speciation. We don't need to invoke niche partitioning. Only a small zone around these conspecific adults is enough to, or saplings fail to recruit, is enough to maintain diversity. And, you know, bringing this back to why this is so cool is that species interactions do all this stuff in plant ecology, like pollination or mycorrhizal fungi um, or seed dispersal, right? Um, but it's pretty cool to think that they could play this really important role in just maintaining tree diversity. Why not have species interactions be part of survival and establishment, ultimately diversity maintenance? Okay, so hope I proved to you that seed dispersal matters. Uh, so, you know, working with these primates, now we'll get to, see, you always put the map at the front and the simulations up front, and then you get into monkeys and bears and stuff. Okay, so you know, I've been working with uh, hunters and primates for quite some time, and I started this back in 2004 in a participatory hunting project in the field where we had these uh, sheets at everyone's house, and they'd mark down as they killed, and mark the weight and the reproductive status. And uh, this led to a series of models that I won't show you, but, but the idea was that you know, hunters live within this zone, and they walk outward daily, and they've got to come back. So most hunting effort is concentrated near villages. So if you look at animals killed versus hunting area, most animals are killed near the village, even though animals have become increasingly depleted near the village, necessitating to walk further and further to catch those species. And then at the same time, you've got diffusion of animals back into this zone. So it's kind of like you're scooping out some molasses and the molasses slowly pours back in, right? So that's what these models try to achieve to deal with these sort of source sink dynamics. So if you want to know more about those, there's some papers back in. 2009 and 2011. Then we followed up on this with all the households in the Brazilian Amazon. So Carlos Perez was able to come up with the Brazilian census data set. So each one of these little dots is a household in the Brazilian Amazon. The Brazilian Amazon is about 28 times larger than Washington State, three times larger than Alaska. So this is not like a small area. 
just the Brazilian Amazon, it's three Alaskans, huge, huge sticks. Okay, so we can take that model, assuming one hunter per household, and so I should have said in Manu National Park in the Peruvian Amazon, we can sort of validate this model using census, um, distance sampling techniques away from villages. So this is what would be depleted. Red is, dark red is extirpated, and as you approach green, you get to untouched. And then if you mask out the area that's not forest or already deforested, that gets us to C here. This, this box is just what it looks like when you zoom in. Okay. You can summarize just how much of the Brazilian Amazon is projected to be extirpated. So of the remaining forest area, we have quite a lot of what would be relatively untouched forest, relatively not over harvested, but then a ton where monkeys are predicted to be extirpated, and then things in between, right? Might be fewer fisheries, biologists you might call that um, over exploited. Okay, so hunting has this really pervasive impact, even on this large landscape, three time, three last is big, right? People are living everywhere, even in the, the last best by far tropical forest on Earth. Okay, so we're losing large primates on large spatial scales. And so one thing we know from field studies is that as seed size gets bigger, if you're naming seedling, the number of species that can disperse them, we've got a massive number of primate dispersers, goes down, right? Large seeded things that are primate dispersed can only be dispersed by these large atollian primates like Alawata, that's howler monkeys, Lagothrix, woolly monkeys, Atelis, spider monkeys, and Alawata are, are poor dispersers. They're, they're more folivorous, they don't move so much. In the Matsuganga culture, if a kid eats a howler monkey, the, the, they're said to grow up to be really lazy. <laughs> sit up in the tree, get a bunch of bot flies, stinky meat. Anyway, uh, woolly monkeys, just one of the coolest monkeys ever. And, and uh, spider monkeys are acrobatic, move large distances, disperse, disperse things large distances, and they're the only dispersers of these large seeded things. And these are the things that are also the most vulnerable to overhunting because they're diurnal, they're group living, they're very slow life history. All things that make you very vulnerable to overhunting. Okay, here's again what those kinds of fruits look like. A lot of them are in the family Sapotaceae, really tasty fruit to humans too. Okay, in addition to their ability to disperse, they just reach really high levels of biomass in unhunted forests that leads them to be, this is now very conservative, the percent of seeds removed this is a field study we did in the Western Amazon, just approximating that woolly monkeys disperse the vast majority of seeds in these forests. Okay, so they're quantitatively, numerically dominant seed dispersers. They also disperse the only dispersion of the large seeds, and they disperse things large distances. So getting back to Jansen Connell effects, you would think this could lead to recruitment failure of things that have large seeds. All right, so just like there's life history trade-offs with mammals, there's life history trade-offs with plants. And if you look at seed size versus wood density, across all these trees, you see this pattern where you've got the mice of the tree world. These are light-wooded, small-seeded things on average. And you've got the elephants in the tree world. These are the large seeded, high wood density things, the slower life history things. Right? These are the things that are going to be more likely to be primate dispersed, or some of them are rodent scatter or whatnot. Right? Okay, so you might think that you would lose wood above ground biomass if highly dense woods are replaced by lighter woods primate dispersed things are replaced by wind dispersed things or bird dispersed things, not these large seeded high wood density plants. Turns out in the Amazon we've got this amazing data set of almost 2,500 tree plots, one hectare tree plots. Each of those tree plots are mapped. Wood density values we get from elsewhere, but the tree, the, the wood, the tree size and tree species is mapped. And we can do a simple simulation. So to start with this is the pattern of above ground biomass in the Amazon just interpret, interpolated from all these tree plots. This is the spatial extent of those tree plots. It's conducted by the government. And we could just conduct two scenarios, right? In each tree plot, we could remove species that require large primate seed dispersal. That'll be scenario one. And then replace them randomly with some other tree on that same plot, right? We've got all the data for each plot. And then scenario two, we'll remove both the large primates and the seeds that require tapers. 
Tapers are also the largest body seed disperser. The really, really large seeds that only they can consume also exist in the spores. Okay, so we're just going to do this, this simulation, taking a, a forest of full faunal assemblage and thinking about what happens as, as you defaunate that forest. Take an individual tree that's blacklisted, meaning its disperser is gone, replace it with another tree, and then do that a thousand times on each plot and look at the average change in above ground biomass of the forest. So this is what it looks like, right? It's yellow, it's lost biomass, it's blue, it's gained biomass. So on average, we lose two and a half percent biomass. Doesn't sound like a lot, two and a half percent. Seventy-seven percent of the plots lose biomass, which you know, if this was a no effect simulation, you might expect it to be 50-50. Some lose, some gain. If you lose tapers, 88% of the plus lose biomass. The average biomass loss is 5.77%. So we're not talking huge numbers, seemingly 2.5%, 5.77%. But remember, the Brazilian Amazon alone is three times the size of Alaska. So if you project a 2.5% biomass loss or a 5.7% biomass loss in space, right, this is where that's expected to happen. This is all spatialized, right? We know where every tree plot is, so we can interpolate where most of that biomass is likely to be lost. And so this is where the Arctic deforestation has moved through the Amazon. It's most of the lowest biomass, the place that stand to lose the least. Okay, so how much does this matter? Well, this is about 300 to 750 metric tons per square kilometer of above ground biomass across these scenarios. Okay. Which at $5 per metric ton, which is now well below what carbon is being traded at in California, I think it's around 15 right now. That's six to almost fourteen trillion dollars. So if you were to lose two and a half percent biomass across the scale of just the Brazilian Amazon, you're talking about a six trillion dollar loss in carbon. Here's a here's the carbon price of 2018 in March, fifteen dollars in California. All right, so I hope that convinces you that if these life history trade-offs are real, which I think we've got large data sets, so I have high confidence there. Uh, what I have lower confidence in is that losing seed dispersals is really going to lead to tree recruitment failure. We don't have great experimental evidence of that. Um, that might be worth trillions of dollars. All right, so the Amazon, tropical forests everywhere, they're losing large bodied seed dispersers, but we have two, and, right? We've got these brown bears that at one time were really abundant due to salmon. But they did all sorts of other things other than eat salmon. And so I'm going to talk to you about work that uh, Jen Allen, um, Lori Hare, and, and Nelson Mungla, these were the two master students working on this project. So I just want to remind us that here's the historic range of grizzly bears. And there were many pockets in the 30s and 50s even. But we've, we've lost them from large parts of the western United States and large parts of a really wide range of species, and many parts of Earth were supported by anadromous fish to reach really high population densities. In eastern North America, you've got a different bear species, the American black bear, you've got the Asiatic black bear, the sloth bear, the sun bear. So bears are a feature of the northern part of Earth. And I think we haven't thought enough about what it means to lose this large body on the board in so many places. Okay, so the first thing you figure out as soon as you work in a salmon system is that bears are really common, have really high population densities. If you want to see this in, in graph form, if you just do stabilized scopes, look at the amount of meat. So it's almost all salmon that bears are consuming versus population density. You get two orders of magnitude increase in bear biomass. They're also larger body bears. You can put a camera on a salmon stream, no baits here, right? This is just what it looks like. There's just bears all the time on salmon streams. August 28th, some random day. If you put it on a lake shore where sockeye are spawning, again, bears have spent a lot of time in these systems, and they do a lot of things, right? They do a lot of things that are well studied. One of the things they do is they take salmon from places like this, where they're inaccessible to vertebrate and invertebrate scavengers. They're not fertilizing the forest, for instance, and they deposit partially consumed carcasses into the forest. This is a chunk salmon the brain and head tissue consumed, a pink salmon with just the eggs consumed, 
And if you put cameras on these things, you get bird scavengers showing up, like Martin, like me, including owls. This is the camera you see here, there's a bear here. I like to imagine this owl is just waiting for that bear to throw the fish. Okay, so bears fertilize the forest, they distribute carcasses, we know that, but what I think has been really neglected is that they're also involved in these seed dispersal mutualisms. And if you go to a place like Southeast Alaska or British Columbia, what you notice is that the understory is just dominated by berry producing shrubs. It's just like everywhere, the dominant understory shrub is blueberry, and then it moves up into the Devil's Club, which is this plant right here. That's the plant that's the dominant understory shrub in our study area. It's useful because it's got this big cluster that's easy to monitor with cameras, which is what I'm going to show you in a second here. But you've got high bush cranberry, red over exposure dogwood, blueberries, all over the landscape for these bears to consume. So we monitored Devil's Club for two years, the Chilka River Valley, the Bee River Valley, northern and southeast Alaska, about 30 miles from the town of This is what you get if you put a camera around some Devil's Club. These are this particular patch of roadside, so they get a lot of sun, they get really big, so that's somewhere around like 700 seeds these bears getting in each of those infrutescences. Sometimes smaller body black bears do it quite differently. It's more of a corn on the cob situation. I find nothing cooler than watching bears eat fruit. I don't know, maybe it's a little bit, but it's just like. <laughs> so you, you, know, you think these tiny red berries are bird dispersed, but if you monitor them, this one seemed like only birds could possibly get it, but that bear on its hind legs dragged it down, consumed it. And then sometimes we get thrushes and robins coming as well. Sometimes after bears have already consumed it, in this case, they leave this little rosette of fruit that bears can consume. So we only had so many cameras. So the other technique we used was to swab stalks that had clearly already had um, berries consumed. And the idea here was to figure out, uh, with a much larger sample size, if we were dealing with black bears or brown bears, male bears or female bears. So this is already during your master swabbing one of these stocks. <laughs> okay, so the thing I didn't show you is that uh, she did a calibration experiment also with bird feeders, which I thought would be really conservative, because one of the ways we, we miss birds is because there's a, a time lag between videos, right? But on a bird feeder, birds are just constantly there. So we multiply the number of berries consumed by birds by five to deal with that calibration experiment. Mm -hmm. The point here is that bears, oops, bears consume a much larger proportion of all berries than birds. Neither species alone, but brown bears, more than black bears, were observed also consuming fruit. Right, so potentially bird dispersal is much less than bear dispersal. If you then compare the bears using genetics, right, this is all camera trap data, if you use the environmental DNA from that residual saliva, brown bears were more important than black bears, female bears were more important than male bears. Right? So define conventional wisdom, which would be, well, black bears are more vegetarian. We're going to be consuming more fruit. This, this is the, uh, we had this talk during Laura's lab meeting about how everything's bullshit. So you should always retest things. Um, okay, so the other thing, you know, we, we put cameras on these things, and you get to observe natural history that's previously unobserved. One of the, one of the coolest things is that the first year we monitored, there was a spruce mast. We had a small mammal project going at the same time. Caught no red squirrels. After that spruce mast in year two, red squirrels were just freaking everywhere, filling all of our shrimp traps. In there, and they steal food from bears. So in year two, these became the dominant consumer. We didn't observe them very much in year one. And if you watch them carefully, you can see they're manipulating the fruit and dropping it and just consuming the seeds. So, I think that's cool. <laughs> All right, so, you know, Devil's Club's easy to monitor because you put a camera right on this big infrutescence. And if you, but if you do things like soap berry, where you really can't see all the berries, you still see just bears come in and they clean out these soap berry patches. And it's just like bear after bear after bear. And they don't come right when they come, they're ripe. Like as soon as they're ripe, we saw bird, 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 and it was kind of disappointing. But then all of a sudden, it's like the whole patch is ripe and bears come through and go down. All right, so the next thing that happens when a bear consumes fruit is it shits in the woods, right? It's a, there's a proverb about that somewhere. Sometimes you see these partially digested uh, bear's heads, like this. 
So it turned out there's only been one study ever that I've been able to find that's quantified the number of seeds in brown bear scats in these salmon rich systems in southeast Alaska. And that was on Chichikov Island, so no mammal sites. So we used a um, very technologically advanced approach of undergrads with tweezers <laughs> to count seeds. And uh, we tried using seeds and all these things, but blueberry seeds, especially dry ones, are so small that we just we couldn't get anything better than undergrads with tweezers. And so this is what we get. So frequency of occurrence is just the proportion of scats that have each of these fruit. So over 80% of the bear scats have some devil's club. Right. So we see about 12 species of fruit. This is roughly representative of, of uh, the relative abundance of these plants based on our vegetation surveys that I'm not showing you. And here's a, just a histogram of the number of seeds per scat. So there's devil's club, that's what their seeds look like, blueberries, their seeds look like. But what I want to draw you to is that sometimes you get 80,000 devil's club seeds in a scat. Sometimes you get 150,000 blueberry seeds in a scat, right? It's a lot of seeds. Right? Here's um, Irish cranberry, there's uh, twisted sock, watermelon berry, and so on. So a lot of seeds. This other one's interesting, this is crowberry. This is a bear that went to the alpine, ate some crowberry, and then came down to our low elevation study area and dedicated out over 80,000 crowberry seeds. Just like relatively long distance seed dispersal. All right, so then what happens, right? They produce these seed filled bear scats, and if you put cameras on those, things get super interesting. So here's a red back bowl. See, this one has an ear tag on it. It's on our small mountain spot. And it's like, look at it being swamped by the seed filled bear scats. It's like, it's amazing. Sometimes you get little families of mice hanging out. Just like brown bears are so big, and their scats just are a marvel at the difference in scat to small mammal body ratio. All right, and sometimes this resource is so valuable that it's worth defending. I feel like the Jedi Masters. <laughs> we, so we see a variety of other species also visit these things, like buried thrush come down to forage in there, we see shrews from time to time. But overwhelmingly it was deer mice and red back bull. So again, this is log scale here in this case. So many, many more deer mice and red back bulls than all the other species. And that varied by whether we were in a conifer dominated spruce hemlock stand or a cottonwood dominated stand near the rough area. And the cottonwood dominates and deer mice were way more abundant, and the conifer dominates and redback bulls were more common. Okay, so do all these bear scats matter, right? Is this an ecologically relevant subsidy? So the first thing we need to do is get do the energetics on the seeds. So how much energy is in all these seeds? We've got gross energy, fat, protein, fiber, all the way to digestible energy per gram. For fruit and seed, we're going to ignore all the fruit, even though I've shown you some partially digested um, scats. So we can use these to produce histograms of kilocals per scat. On average, it's about 100 kilocals per scat. Based on the energetic needs of mice, the rare scat can support a mouse for 100 days, but mostly we're talking about 10, 20, 30 days per scat. All right, so that's it. That's a significant subsidy per scat. We have to scale up to the population scale. But the other thing is it's not just about how many scats and how many seeds are in the scat, it's also about phenology. Because if you look from July 15th to September 1st, it's kind of a busy figure. Brown bears started consuming devil's bug here in late August. They were the dominant consumer of devil's bug until Santa arrived, that's in gray here. After that, black bears became the dominant consumer of devil's bug. Presumably because brown bears monopolized the resource, moved to sand, and then black bears access the resource. Uh, and black bears is just how ripe the fruit are, ripeness and depth. Okay, in any case, without bears, this is when devil's club starts senescing and drop their fruit and seeds. So the seeds would not even be available to mice until mid September, if not for bears removing them and deposit, depositing them on the forest floor. So there's the provisioning of these nicely, nice foraging piles but also the extension of the phenology of availability of all these seeds that are sequestered in large, large plants. Okay, so how many mice can bear scats support? Well, so back at the envelope, our small mammal study produced densities of 860 per square kilometer to 2,500 2, per square kilometer in conifer and cottonwood areas, respectively, quite large densities in cottonwood. Um, somebody actually did a study to figure out how much bears shit every day. 
<laughs> Thank goodness for that. Right? Seven times a day. <laughs> right? uh, because you know they're preparing for hibernation, so they're in hyperphagia eating. You know, you know, what happens. Right? All right. Uh, seed-based digestible energy per scat is about 113 kilocals using just the seeds alone. Uh, the deer mice energetic requirements come from deer. So the question of what is bear density. That's the hardest question because you can look at many scales. But what we're really concerned about is in riparian areas because these are strongly dissected river valleys that go up into steep glacial covered mountains. Right? We don't want to include all those glaciers. We want to include in those river valleys, bear densities are somewhere on the order of five per square kilometer. Right? At the region, more on the order of one per square kilometer. But in those riparian areas, the energetic subsidy can be responsible for a non insignificant proportion of the energetic needs of deer mice at these densities, at these dedications, right? approaching 50% in uh, conifer, approaching 20% in conifer. All right, so here's how I think this system works. I think what's happening, well, I feel strongly about this, right? You need to carry a firearm or a bear spray, large group size, hay bear all the time, right? There's a lot of bears. That's true. I know this happens. I know this happens. And we know from other work that these mice act as secondary seed dispersers. They bury about two or three seeds per cache, about two millimeters below the surface. Seeds get unburied and reburied multiple times. Redback bulls, we don't think do any of this behavior. They're larger hoardings, so they're purely seed predators. So we think they're secondary seed dispersal. They're mice. And this part, I have no idea, right? Does this matter for plant demography at all? Are these plants at all dispersal limited? So I think that's really important area for future, for future research. Glacier Bay is a great place to do this, actually, because you've got this deglaciating landscape and stuff has to get there, right? Bears play this role in getting stuff there. And so on. And so another question we don't know yet is, does this resource subsidy matter enough that it supports more mice that then reverberates back up in food webs? It's a very low diversity system, right? There's not a lot of players in town. If you can keep mice or bulls more abundant, that could be important. All right, probably don't have much time because it says 53 minutes here. So rather than roll through my, uh, my conclusions, I'll just say thank you and see if there's any time for questions. Questions for Tom? I think you explained this already, but on the Thousand species. Why didn't it start at a thousand times zero? Why did it? Why didn't it? It did. Oh. But none of those, none of the graphs are starting. Oh, because they don't start at zero. Because uh, you can't take log of zero. So this. So this, immediately after one. They lose. They lose species so quickly at first that by the time I'm showing you the first point, it's already lost a bunch of species. Okay. Yeah. That's not reason. Yeah. Um, I really like the talk. Thanks very much. And in the first one that you were talking about how specialization kind of becomes, more, being rare becomes more important as the densities. The species versus declines. As the diversity increases, exactly. So I was thinking of how do you think about the other interactions there? Like as you become more rare, also the price to become specialized to you is higher and the reward is lower. So how other predators will affect that? You know what I mean? Like higher orders and trophic interaction. Yeah, so, so you're saying as you become rare, so you, you get this advantage by Jensen Connell effects, but you lose other things, right? And there you're assuming that all the species are perfectly, they have perfectly specialized predators, each one of them, right? That's right, yeah. And that as you become more rare, then the advantage of being specialized to that species in particular is lower. Oh, I Therefore, for it's the, more for the likely enemy. that if you have a bunch of really, really highly specialized than having one generalist. Yeah, so, so in reality, the one-to-one -one correlation is not remotely perfect, right? Because it's just like when you go to hang out with gorillas, which are your relative, you can transmit the common cold to them. Right? Same thing happens here. So conspecifics share the same pathogens. The vast majority of the time, 90-something percent. Congeners, some poor are 80 percent. Confamilial, 70 percent. So there's a phylogenetic signal that's not just about the you know, concept of species. So, Fungal pathogens, 
might specialize on a family, not necessarily a species. So it is just sort of an abstraction to treat it as perfectly host specific. Like a complication that would be really cool would be to add a phylogeny to this and think about phylogenetic diversity maintenance, not just species richness maintenance. Um, but I think there are other effects like what you're talking about, because when you become, you, you might imagine that your, the size of your exclusion zone might increase as you become abundant, because at the landscape scale, you're supporting those natural enemies. The other complication that's really interesting is that as you become rare, you, you might get this advantage because you're not excluded from anywhere on the landscape and your competitors are. But if there's pollination limitation, that can really hurt you. Right? If you've got a, some sort of special seed disperser that's no longer sticking around. Like imagine this is a fig that requires a specific fig wasp. Right? As that fig becomes rare, that's a situation where you get like an OE effect. Right? So you, certainly you're going to have OE effects with some tree species for, for these reasons, if they're pollen limited or, or that sort of thing. I'm, I'm curious how uh, you know, spatial and temporal variability would play into actually both parts of this talk. So the first part in terms of the simulation, you, you mentioned it was like a 15 million year to billion year time scale. Um, so what happened if over that time scale if um, the, the Amazon land is getting over the past um, even tens of thousands of years has, has experienced a fair amount of variability um, kind of shifting back and forth between the Savannah state and, and uh, depending on where you, where you are within the Amazon. Um, uh, so how would that kind of that, that long-term environmental variability kind of affect the jensen connell hypothesis um, kind of at that scale? And then to the, to the bare seed system, if you've got fires coming through and kind of a, 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 a fairly disturbance heavy system, uh, could bears be a, kind of playing a role in uh, uh, kind of founder effects by, by bringing in 80,000 seeds in one place and, and kind of influencing mm -hmm. the spatial dynamics of those. Yeah, right. So starting with bears, I mean, what I think would be really cool to do is take a forest that maybe is a closed canopy coniferous forest and it gets logged, right? And now all of a sudden there's a bunch of light available so you can have shrubs, a place like Prince of Wales or someplace that's heavily logged um, and has closed canopy forests and put fences around it to prevent bears in some areas and prevent mice from bringing in seeds and not elsewhere. So do an experiment to see are bears playing this role in revegetating particular species. Because not all shrubs are animals first. And certainly you've got things like alder, you've got this weird um, rusty menziza, people call it fossil azalea, has no fleshy fruit. Um, so I have questions I don't know about bears, but, but I think that this is a really High disturbance landscape. You've got things like landscape slides, deglaciation, constant new land getting produced in southeast Alaska. So, uh, whether bears play a really significant role there, I don't know. But I think that's an important area of research, right? It's, I, I feel like it's similar to when we started thinking about the role of wolves in ecosystems as, as they were reintroduced and everyone started getting on that. Um, I think we should think a little bit more about the role of bears in ecosystems, and it's probably going to take several careers to tease out well, what exactly do bears do? Like, they're really important anteaters. They're tearing up wood. Does that matter for nest sites, or do they actually affect hymenoptera abundance? Do, there's there's so many ecological interactions that have been unexplored with bears, but that's that's like diverging from your question. Um, but in the Amazon, uh, I mean, there are theories of plant diversity that are based entirely on disturb like the intermediate disturbance hypothesis is a disturbance based theory of plant diversity. And certainly things that do happen in tropical forests that are not included here are things like every time you get a tree fall gap, you initially have a specific subset of species that are pioneer things that are light wooded, fast growing, that create some shade, but then, you know, they never exist in the canopy. Right? There are things like Epiraceae, Cecropias, they shoot up light wooded and after a while get out competed by dense wooded canopy trees, right? Um, so I think there's a niche in disturbance. There, there's things like um, fast colonizers that are able to be maintained just because of disturbance. Right? There's also clear niches in like the seasonally flooded varzias maintain a specific subset of things. So it's a complicated question because disturbance at different scales does different things. It also contributes to speciation. Right on one scale, you've got mountain ranges that pop up and create speciation. You've got new rivers that form that create isolation to create new species. So there's mechanisms of species creation through disturbance and mechanisms of species maintenance through disturbance. It's really hard to 
if, if one were to try to put all these things into a model, it wouldn't be a very good model, right? In the, in the Einstein sense of a good model, where you want to be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Um, I think if you want to just dial into a, a specific mechanism, how strong its effects could be, I think that, like the absolute simplest you can make that model, the better, and then build up off that. Because otherwise you're dealing with, what is it? Is, how sensitive are you here versus there? It's hard to imagine, though, that something like the intermediate disturbance hypothesis could maintain and observe levels of species richness just based on intuition, right? because there's such a small subset of trees that are those tree fall gap lovers, right? and they're a very predictable subset. Is that a decent answer? Yeah. <laughs> So I love the, the simplicity of this simulation. And is this kind of making any assumptions about the mobility or lack of mobility of the enemies? And so I'm, I'm just wondering how the mobility of the enemies might affect things. That's a good question. Um, well, I guess it's assuming that once you're a reproductive adult, you are maintaining enemies. It's unclear when exactly those enemies arrive, because depending on, for your species, if you're invertebrate, it's like brooked beetles. Right? When I was doing this um, experiment with, with recruitment near far from the tree, we tried to collect thousands of Manilkara seeds, and just so many of them were already parasitized by brooked beetles, um, or if they're fungal pathogens, which I think is probably more important people generally think. Part of the reason people think they're more important is that if you do a fungus fungicide experiment, you can get tons of recruitment. So if you plant conspecifics near a tree and you fungicide it, psh, that's great. Um, so I don't know that people have thought about the mobility of enemies at all. Like, can fungal pathogens make it to trees and colonize them? I think that's a really good question. The thing that I think is more important with mobility here is um, to make this really simple, there's no dispersal curve. So any tree can replace any other tree, right? But of course, uh, seeds can only go so far. Most of these things could go 800 trees across. Like most, that's not such a great distance. But as you scale up to larger and larger landscapes, it becomes really impossible that you can go from one spot to any other spot. So you know, 200 billion iterations just takes a computer so long to do. So that we're working on adding all sorts of complications, but we require new approaches. Opposite end of that, how do you get this brown bear scat back? Are you carrying like garbage bags out of the potatoes? Uh, my grad student mailed it to my mailed it to me, and she did a terrible job packaging. It was like Ziploc bags in a black garbage bag, no ice or anything, and then it shows up at our lab, actually in the front office, and it's just like stinking hot. Because for days it's just like oozing, and it's like dripping. Liquid, it was terrible. So that's how they came back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking that's a lot of seeds. Like, yeah, when we pick up scat and do, I feel like we don't need that big of a bag. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, I mean, where do you pick up brown bear scats? We're not picking up brown bear scats. Oh. That's what like, I'm saying. I'm oh, sure. yeah. You, you know, you need like a freezer bag <laughs> for these brown bear scats, definitely. Yeah. Sorry, oh, yeah. So, the way you, you did the simulation clearly makes your point. So I'm, I'm convinced, right? Yeah. Um, but if you think about uh, a number of disturbances simplifying your species diversity, they're working against you. Uh, so you know, I imagine as you put diversity in and show. Do you make sense? Extinction rates? Yeah, you're up to extinction rates. But then you you have a contrasting factor that you haven't taken much, and that you got microtopography. You've got soil differences, you've got lots of things that, that should be pushing up your diversity. Totally, I agree. It, you know, and so have you tried playing with varying those and seeing how important each of those factors are in, in determining you know, what's happening? Yeah, so it's definitely on my next step. The way I think about that problem, the, that latter one, is that this could be playing out within every niche, right? So you might have a niche that is, um, imagine, got a rainfall gradient and 
you certainly have things that are more drought loving and more drought tolerant than others, right? But you could think of it as like a drought loving niche or drought tolerant niche, and a, even though it's continuous, and a not drought tolerant niche. But then within there, you might get, you might actually get weaker gents and conal effects, right? Gents and conal effects are thought to be weaker in dry forest than in wet forest. So there might be all these interactions, strength of gents and conal effects across the niches. Um, Just beta diversity. Right? You, you've got changes going across your landscape that are happening in that kind of scale. Oh, totally. You know, yeah. so you've got lots of things that could, could increase your person. Totally, yeah. So I think the goal, a goal I have for pushing this forward is to be able to replicate observed patterns of tree composition. Right? So for one, tree species are clustered. Well, this simulation does not produce clustering tree species, right? To get clustered cluster tree species, you need larger disturbances in one tree, and then you need correlation about which tree recruits. So you know, you've got this happens, right? You go and you see a seedling carpet, you get saplings that are recruiting. So, when you, for example, when you get this pattern, right here, you get saplings that recruit. But the process that led to that is that they didn't recruit near a conspecific adult, and they all recruited. There's correlation among that tree species recruitment because the process that leads to that is some monkey has a sleeping tree and defecates out a bunch of seeds, or some such event leads to some correlation structure there. Um, so producing clusters, dealing with uh, these simulations lead to more evenness than you observe in tropical forests. Tropical forests have a you know this sort of log normal pattern kind of stuff that we get that same pattern in kind of like this. It's much more even. So how do we get less evenness? There's got to be a mechanism for that. Is it variability in the exclusion zone size? Is it um, very, like exclusion zones that come into being and then phase out of being? So you drift towards monodominance, but evolution plays a role, and exclusion zones build up as fungal pathogens start to figure it out. Because you know, how do tree species even arrive here? Some of it is you get some patrick or allopatric speciation, but you also get these crazy events. Like people who study um, the plant systematics. I saw this amazing talk about species that might arrive all the way from Africa, make it to the eastern part of South America, and then start taking over. Like, like, they arrived 30, 60 million years ago, and then they could start, which that, that just blew my mind, right? The species of communities from Africa on those, those technical scales. Anyway, I think that as we move forward with this field, we're gonna have to replicate what we observe in nature here. So, you know, first, I think you gotta say, is this mechanism plausible? If it is, then can we take it the next steps? So it's quite related to that question. Is it possible in that grid model to apply like an exclusion zone, like limited the seed source to a certain distance to the patch that appears? Totally. Yeah, it, well, or start. like make a pair of bold spots that simulate disturbance. You should definitely make a game out of that. I will play that game. <laughs> 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 it's like a, a website in which you can just change the thing. <laughs> Our time. <laughs> all, the, all the complications I'm excited about, there's well, two limitations. One is funding, which we have none of. But the other one, <laughs> the other one is, uh, is computers. It's, we, the first step has been, we, this was all done on CPUs. Even though it was high performance computing, it was done on CPUs, not GPUs. So now we're porting it to GPUs. And even that has not done the speed that we want. So now our, instead of doing one tree species at a time, we're going to do one year at a time. And so on a large landscape, if the average tree survives 300 years, then like the tree death rate is one over 300. And so on a landscape of a million trees, it's a lot of tree deaths per year. And so in reality, that's how trees should be responding because right, all those trees die in one year, and then whatever can recruit depends on the existing trees that are present in the landscape. They don't actually update sequentially one tree at a time. And so I think that's gonna allow us to get to 200 billion much more quickly because all the deaths happen in one year. And that might allow the computational power to do things like dispersal kernels, and every complication we want dealing with phylogenetics, not just one species excludes itself, but it excludes congeners and so on. Um, and then disturbances of various sizes, correlated recruitment, all those complications that are going to help, I think, that we know exist, like we know from field biology exist, that could help reproduce patterns of certain nature. Oh, one last one. Um, <clears throat> do you really need 200 billion? Do I really what? Need 200 billion. You do, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't you get away with well, a I little think, less than that? Uh, not really. 
really. <laughs> not, not if you want to work on larger landscapes. And we have an analytical model with this, so Markov chains that can do it, but it's that's an approximation. But like, look at this, and we're not losing any species after 200 billion here. And this is like I'd like to work on larger landscapes than just 1600 by 1600 trees, right? I'd like to explain regional diversity and add dispersal because. A seed could disperse that far. But there's long distance seed dispersal. So we're not dealing with these really large landscapes. Um, certainly, most of the diversity is lost in the first two billion generations. That's definitely yeah. But like, these horizontal lines are pretty cool. <laughs> but that is the scale that you have, like the Amazonian rainforest is maintaining diversity at that first in the beginning now. The other one, evolutionary one, is how it got there or how it long term it got there. But the one that is kind of intriguing is how it maintains the diversity right now, like okay. the ecological diversity. Yeah. Um, it's true. I mean, it would be nice to work at the scale of a basin and think about, you know, you can imagine that a tree species exists on this corner of the basin and then a million years later, it's moved over here, right? And tree species are drifting through time and space um, because dispersal has some finite distance and maybe this cluster of trees if it dies out through random chance, but this cluster survives and new one is born. So, you know, ultimately it'd be nice to be able to simulate a forest and how a forest works with the sort of biology we you know to exist. And I think most of those things are going to require a little bit bigger landscape. You know, because eventually you want to incorporate things like speciation too, right? Speciation matters. And, you know, the thing that nobody's brought up is that neither neutral theory or chance and Connell effects talk explicitly about differences in fitness. So there's also potentially intrinsic differences in fitness among those trees, right? It's very hard to measure. There's no data on intrinsic differences in fitness. Because certainly there's going to be intrinsic differences in fitness under a particular set of environmental conditions. Which I mean, that's essentially the concept of a niche, right? So that's that gets back to overlaying niches on top of this. All right. Any other questions for Tom? Well, <clears throat> we have the uh, some snacks and beer and wine, and uh, so please uh, let's thank Tom for a fascinating talk, and you can continue uh, chatting with him after. Here's the chat.